Hello once again. This is Angela Murjani from Kasturba Gandhi College in Hyderabad and I hope you will enjoy today's lesson, the objective of which is to make us more socially aware as responsible citizens of our great nation. Today we are going to do a poem by Sir Stephen Spender, an English poet, novelist and essayist who lived across most of the 20th century, having been born in 1907 and dying in 1995. The 20th century was an era of great technological and scientific change and innovation. Obviously, such change would dramatically affect the lives of people who lived in that time. And so it did. Some of these changes were good, but some of them were not so good. So it was left for people like Stephen Spender to bring out some of the grave social injustices and the anomalies that existed in the society of that time and to help us to be more aware of such injustices that were being meted out to certain sections of society. Being a literary artist, Spender used his works, that's his poems and his essays and his novels, as tools or vehicles to draw attention or to focus on these wrongs that he felt needed to be righted in the society of his time. Spender attended University College, Oxford, where in 1973 he was made an honorary fellow. He left Oxford without completing his degree and subsequently lived periodically in Germany. He confessed of himself that he had never passed an exam in his life ever. His closest friend and the man who influenced him the most was W. H. Auden, also a great influential intellectual of his time. Much of Spender's early poetry, notably his compilation known as Poems, published in 1933, was often inspired by social anger. He was appointed the 17th Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry to the United States Library of Congress in 1965. Spender was later appointed Professor of English at University College London and in the year 1983, he was knighted by the Queen. In the poem, An Elementary School Classroom in a slum, Stephen Spender highlights the plight of children in a government-run school, depicting the kind of education that's doled out by the government to them. It's the sort of education that hardly does them any good. And on the contrary, it serves only to draw more attention to the deprivation and the sorry state of affairs that these children already find themselves in. While the government appears to be doing its bit, the relevance and the quality of what it is doing is highly questionable. Also, the general attitude of apathy on the part of the more privileged members of society towards those who are less privileged is very disturbing to Spender. Spender seems upset by both the government's mishandling of the situation, as well as the indifference of the more privileged members of society towards those who really need the concern and the compassion of those who find themselves in positions of privilege. There is, according to Spender, a general insensitivity to the needs of the poor that definitely requires to be addressed and that's exactly what Spender is trying to do in this particular poem. This poem is an eye-opener for us because it helps to throw light upon the plight of many children in state-run schools in our own nation who perhaps find themselves in the similar situation. Hopefully, it may motivate us to do something to alleviate those places of darkness and to bring the light which is in our lives into the lives of those slum children like the ones mentioned in Spender poem. The poem is not a critique of education, but it definitely does seek to satirize and to criticize the mode in which education is sometimes delivered to those who are its recipients. 
often there is no thought given to adapting the system to the needs of those who are the primary stakeholders. And in this case, it is the students themselves. Spender believed that education must bring transformation and change to our lives. And if it does fail to do this, then there is definitely something wrong with the system. It is this flaw in the system which Spender addresses in this poem. If the people who receive education are not transformed and not changed by it, then everybody needs to rethink this situation. What makes this poem highly relevant to us in India today is that some of those challenges and obstacles that are being addressed in the poem written by Spender in the 20th century are still very relevant to us in today's India of the 21st century. If we can learn from the mistakes of others, then we can prevent this grief from coming to many of our own households. Now let's read the poem before we go into a stanza by stanza analysis of what it holds for us. An Elementary School Classroom in a Slum by Stephen Spender. Far, far from the gusty waves, these children's faces, like rootless weeds, the hair torn around their pallor, the tall girl with her weighed down head. The paper-seeming boy with rat's eyes, the stunted, unlucky air of twisted bones, reciting a father's gnarled disease, his lesson from his desk. At back of the dim class, one unnoted, sweet and young. His eyes live in a dream of squirrel's game, in the tree room other than this. On sour cream walls, donations, Shakespeare's head, Cloudless at dawn, civilized dome riding all cities, belt, flowery Tyrolese valley, open handed map awarding the world its world. And yet, for these children, these windows, not this world, are world, where all their futures painted with a fog, a narrow street sealed in with a lead sky, far far from rivers, capes, and stars of words. Surely Shakespeare is wicked and the map a bad example, with ships and sun and love tempting them to steal for lives that slyly turn in their cramped holes from fog to endless night. On their slag heap, these children wear skins peeped through by bones and spectacles of steel with mended glass, like bottle bits on stones. All of their time and space are foggy slum. So blot their maps with slums as big as doom. Unless governor, teacher, inspector, visitor, this map becomes their window and these windows that shut upon their lives like catacombs Break, oh break open, till they break the town and show the children green fields and make their world run azure on gold sands and let their tongues run naked into books, the white and green leaves open. History is theirs whose language is the sun. opens with a striking image of contrast where the poet is seeking to establish right in the beginning what these children in a slum classroom are absolutely not. They are not gusty, zestful and vigorous like the winds that drive the waves. In all probability, they are limp and lifeless, completely lacking in enthusiasm and energy. Line 2 introduces the image of the rootless weed to describe the children, creating a double impact. Weeds are a nuisance for anyone that has to do anything with plants. They are unwanted, resilient and hard to get rid of. In addition, they are rootless. 
the poet thereby suggesting that where these children have come from is uncertain. Their antecedents or their parentage is not clear at all. And the society views children who live in a slum with just such a perception. To society in general, they are as unwanted as weeds. People in general would rather not confront the reality of these underprivileged classes of society. Their lack of nurturing and the unwanted aspect of their lives is reflected in the untidy and unkempt hair that straggles all around their pale and undernourished faces. In lines 3 to 8, the poet gives us a description of a few of the children in this classroom. Now, the most striking thing that you will notice about these children is that they are very different from the children that you and I have probably seen bounding around a school compound. There is a tall girl who is bowed down, weighed down by the weight of her positioning in society. It's almost as if the cumulative effect of the burdens of her life the shame, the poverty, the hopelessness is more than she can bear. She cannot even hold her head up straight, nor put her shoulders aright. Apart from that, she seems to be too old for the class. Another boy, paper thin, emaciated, his eyes looking around the classroom like a rat, full of fear and suspicion. One student, Spender calls an unlucky heir, while all the students in the classroom have, without exception, inherited the poverty and the despair of their parents, this unlucky heir has in addition inherited his father's disease. The stunted and twisted bones of his body are his inheritance. Underlining the irony, Spender says, that this boy, instead of reciting his lessons and beautiful poems about stars and animals, through his body is reciting the disease which he has inherited from his father. Such tragedy. There is also implicit the suggestion that perhaps this disease could have been addressed if they had access to medical facilities, maybe if they could afford it, but obviously this was not within the scope of their lot. Right at the back of the classroom is a sweet little boy whom nobody has noticed. He is busy with his own daydream in which he's chasing a squirrel around the tree. It appears that the inhibiting atmosphere of the classroom has not touched him as yet. And that is only because he has been able to escape from this inhibiting atmosphere by virtue of his imagination. Physically, he is in the class, but mentally, he is somewhere else, like often happens to many of our students in our classrooms. The poet seems to suggest if one wants one's imagination to not die, and if one wants one's dreams to stay alive, then the only way is to escape from the classroom. If you can't do it physically, then you must do it at least in your imagination. In lines 9 to 16, Spender paints a vivid picture of the classroom for us. Everything that is to be found on the walls of this classroom is the exact opposite of the reality that is in the lives of these children. In their lives, there is no intellectual stimulation. There are no great marvels of architecture. There is not even the natural beauty of gushing rivers or valleys filled with flowers. The walls, Spender says, are covered with sour cream, suggesting that the paint had seen a better day. Once it had been bright and fresh, but now it appears like cream that's going bad. Prominently displayed is a picture of Shakespeare, the very symbol of learning and everything of high academic standard. 
There is also another portrait of a dome to represent man's achievements in architecture. And this is positioned against a bright clear dawn, suggesting that such architecture means the beginning of a new era of civilization. Another portrait represents an Austrian valley which is covered with flowers and so beautiful. But even this Tyrolese civilization is a distant illusion for the children of these slum dwellers in the classroom. Everything in the room is a reminder of how far removed from that reality these children are. Every donation is a reminder that somebody wealthy has done an act of charity towards them. Somebody has donated something and this only serves to emphasize the poverty and the needs of these little slum children. Instead of increasing their self-esteem, it only helps to make them feel even more deprived as it reminds them time and time again of the poverty and the needs that they have in their lives. In lines 11 to 16, Spender further describes the classroom. The map of the world on the wall serves only to increase their frustration. It describes in detail a sharp contrast to the boundaries of this classroom, which are limitations that make this room into a prison for the children. In seeing that the map is awarding the world its world, Spender seems to suggest that there are two worlds. One is a world that has so much surplus that it can give. And another is a world that has so much deprivation that it can only receive. In other words, there are two worlds, one of privilege and one of lack. While the map of the world has symbols like the sun and ships, which all represent adventure. They represent widening and broadening horizons and endless possibilities that are open to people who can find themselves on the seas. This contrasts sharply with the narrow streets of the slum and the fog-filled atmosphere with the leaden sky only complicates this particular image. The narrow streets represent the restricted options and opportunities that are open to people who dwell in the slum. And that, together with the leaden sky and the foggy atmosphere, only serve to represent a future that is almost impenetrable to somebody whose circumstances are such as those who are living in a slum. In lines 17 to 21, Spender calls Shakespeare wicked and he says that the map is a bad example. Now why would he be doing this? Probably because in being there, these two objects cause the children to aspire to a better life and in aspiring for something which is totally out of their reach, they possibly could do something that's wrong. Both pictures represent the pinnacles of achievement in their own respective fields. Shakespeare stands for the ultimate in learning and in knowledge and in comprehension of human nature, while on the other hand, the map represents the very absolute in the realm of adventure. The portrait of the Tyrolese civilization suggests again all that man can achieve and accomplish through his own initiative and hard work. Therefore, Spender calls the portrait of Shakespeare wicked because he says, although it presents to them an intellectual standard that appears to be desirable to these children, at the same time, it fails to empower them to achieve that standard. Likewise, the map too lures children on to adventure without equipping them with any of the tools that would be necessary to embark on such an adventure. Not having all of these tools, accomplishing such architecture as is depicted in the portrait would be an impossibility. It would be totally out of the grasp of these poor deprived slum children. Looking again at their home lives, the poet compares their bodies to slag heaps or mounds of industrial waste, 
or bundles of bones covered by skin, those bones protruding out of the skin. Their homes are holes, unable even to give them a night of peaceful, relaxed sleep as they toss and turn in the discomfort of those tiny little hovels. In lines 22 and 23, Spender goes on to tell us how these children lack even bare essentials. Some of them that need to wear glasses have glasses that have been broken several times and have been repaired in a most unprofessional manner. He calls them bottles on stone as if they were fixed from pieces of glass taken from the bottles of drink. Anyone who wears glasses will be able to tell you that if they are not repaired properly by a professional, the vision would be impaired and what the wearer would see would be something that would be very foggy and dull and not at all clear. So in effect, what Spender is saying that in wearing glasses that were repaired with bits of bottle, these children were looking at a future with an impairment. The future that they would see would be doomed to be foggy and full of despair because their perception of it had a wrong beginning, a wrong start. Again, while saying that these bottle bits are on stone, Spender seems to suggest that the countenances or the faces of these little children was like stone, impervious to change, hardened by their circumstances and not open to anything that the possibilities of the future might even bring them. In other words, the poet seems to suggest that the school was not serving any purpose at all. It left those children just as hopeless, just as full of despair and in the same condition of poverty as it had found them before. In the final stanza, Spender suggests one final remedy that could help this situation. If only there was one person in a position of influence, like maybe a governor or a teacher who had some powers or a visitor or even an inspector, somebody who would come and look at these children in their plight with compassion and do something for them, then possibly they could break out into a future where there was brightness and real knowledge and real learning would take place. The lives of the children, which had thus far been like graves, shut up in a catacomb, would be released and just like the map that was in their classroom, they would be able to set sail and go forth in a new world where there would be new vistas, new vistas to break into, to learn and to explore. There they would find freedom in the wide open world and the real possibilities of learning would be unfurled before them. The green fields represent the fields of knowledge where they can run around unhampered by the limitations of their background. Nature herself would be their book and they can lap up hungrily all the knowledge they desire directly from her. The sun is very literally the light giver, shedding its bright light onto their lives, bringing energy and life, vitality and enthusiasm, all that they had never known before. This real education is what will open, in truth, the windows of their minds, the windows that had remained shut in stanza two, restricting them to the narrow streets and the foggy sky. The last stanza is brimming with hope and optimism. Even as Spender had been sharply critical of the government and of society for its apathetic attitude towards a large section of the population who are underprivileged, in this last stanza, he expresses his faith. He says that he is sure that somebody will come up from somewhere who will spring into action and do something for these poor slum children. Whoever that person is, 
he or she would look upon the plight of these children with compassion and be moved to do something on behalf of those who are unable to do anything for themselves. They would use their position of influence and power to help these children to break forth from the prison that had kept them shackled and bound up and enable them to move out into that world which was represented on the map so that knowledge and freedom could truly be theirs in reality. Spender was one who truly believed in the power of education to transform lives. But that power of transformation would be limited if the system did not adapt itself to meet the varying needs of different strata of society. And that's where this poem becomes really relevant and important for us today, that there are people who will not fit into the regular mold of education and changes and flexibility are both required in order to suit this system of education to the needs of the recipients. When that happens, there will be a breaking such as is mentioned in line 28, a breaking of restrictions, a breaking of obstacles, a breaking of everything which holds these children back, a breaking off from the old and a breaking forth into the new so that they might explore in liberty all that had been held back from them thus far. The breaking forth is highly dramatic and truly radical for these children because it involves a breaking forth from the graves or the catacombs and a sailing forth into new vistas on the horizon, new explorations where they can view the world and learn about it in their own terms, where perhaps they can even rewrite history in their own manner. It is then and only then can these children be said to have truly been transformed by the power of education. For then, these slum children would have been transported from virtual death into life in real time. <laughs>